Okay, let's learn. I wanted, I'm going to have to do a lot of uh, oral teaching today because I want to finish this and I want to get to the point. We are discussing um, um, losing our minds on Purim and what it means. Uh, we discussed at length that this seems to be something atrocious. It is a terrible thing to be inebriated. We discussed how this is a really... Come in, come in, come in. Hello? Everybody okay? Yeah. Oh, Daniel Cord is there. Okay. Um, we discussed how Ramam really, uh, this goes back, Ramam described when you see a person inebriated, you should see them as if he's walking in the street nude. That's how you should relate to him. You know, this is a person which is obviously has no dignity at all. He's like an animal. Really, he really goes far and says that. He also writes in another place of the person who is drunk, you cannot serve God that way. Therefore, a person engaging in these um uh, such activities is screaming, I don't want to serve God. Because you cannot serve God without God awareness, and you can't have a real serious God awareness if you're either inebriated or you're just flippant or, uh, you know, comical, etc. You really have to be, you have to think seriously what you're doing. Um, so, the obvious question is, what's happening on Purim? Why is it important, even according to Rambam, to, um, you know, literally uh, lose consciousness? Rambam says you're supposed to drink and and to fall in a slumber from your from, from that drinking. That's why we pass in the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, that, by the way, is only part of the Suda. Anybody engaging in any such activities not part of the Suda, is not fulfilling the mitzvah at all. He's just getting drunk, which is, you know, it's another issue. But that's not part of, it only did in the Suda. Uh, uh, that's why I actually, I said after the McGill in the morning, I wash my hands, make a kazai bread, drink a revis yayin, because that's the oisim of the moody. I don't usually drink a revis yayin. I don't even like wine that much. I'm more of a um, uh, single mall type of man. So why it gets me a bit dizzy, I get fall asleep, I go to sleep, wake up half an hour later, I was doing to the mitzvah. No, whatever I want to do, I can do. Okay, you know, you know, whatever I do, I do, whatever other people do, they do. Okay. But the idea behind it is he also seems to see an important issue of Chayyib Kinish the Psumba Pariah, one should somehow be uh intoxicated. What exactly does that mean, by the way? Let me explain, because this is something which already we're, we're turning the corner into a reality. We have to know what it means. So if you open up all the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, they all write that until but not that. Why? Because the purpose of this is to be somewhat free and less inhibited in order to bring out a true sense of, uh, of simcha for, and, and, and praising God for the ness of the occurrences of Purim, which you're going to have to explain a bit today what exactly that was. Whatever we understand what Purim was, the idea is to be mishabeachu, to be fa'er, literally to praise and to Lord God and thank him for whatever happened on Purim and how that affects our lives today in 2024, wherever we are. And uh, therefore, and you should do it in an uninhibited way, the idea behind it is to lose inhibitions. Many times we're reserved and we don't say what we really want to feel and we don't express it. There's a Gemara in Shabbos where the Gemara said that two, two, two sons of Rebchia came to a suit of Rebbe Akiva and they were very reserved. So Rebbe Akiva says, pour wine, brother, let them drink wine a lot and then they'll say good things. And it says, well, they got to a bit tipsy and they said things that people never heard before. So it's deep Saita So the idea behind it is yes, we are to lose our inhibitions and then somehow rejoice in a very free way. I would hopefully mean it means to say that you have so much internalized wisdom and values that you don't express naturally because you're a reserved person and they come out. And somehow they bust forward and you actually thank God in a, in a way which is more authentic than you normally would. But we are naturally reserved. We naturally have certain social inhibitions, etc. And that's the idea behind it. The question is, why is that important? Why is the idea of losing inhibitions and, and being totally free without your, your, your natural das to temper your, your, your behavior, which we normally do, 
is the avoid the Sayyayim of Purim? That is the question. I, I'm, I'm for, first thing, it, uh, formulating that way, it's not to be drunk, it's not to be intoxicated, it's to be, a, it's an idea of losing inhibition to the extent that naturally you will fall asleep. The Ramu even says the more, lose consciousness by fall, falling asleep. I'd like to understand what he means by that. Why is there an important value in losing consciousness to the extent of falling asleep? And I'm going to say it again. The idea behind this all is to be Meshabeach Lachadish Barcho, which praise God and the great things that whatever Purim means to people or what it means to Allah. That's, I just have to put this in because it's going to, there, it's going to, you're going to lose that. So, uh, what's the Abba to say about Purim? That's really what I want to understand. So, I'm going to give a small hug dumb before we go further in this mimer. I'm going to read to you. A um, a source called Likutei Hagra. This was printed in Warsaw, Tufresh in 1889, uh, Tufresh Memtes, with the Biurim of the Talmud Tamidi of the Gura, Rabbi Isaac Chaver, a great Makubal of the Academy of the Gura. It's called Likutei Hagra, and there's a piece there on Purim. I want to read. I'm going to read a certain part of it, and he writes as follows: Inyan Purim, Huk Neged Yom Purim. It is the counterpart of Yom Kippurim. And he writes, Yom Kippurim and Yom Kippur, she'en bo achila v'shtia, we don't drink or eat uh, on Yom Kippur, negdo Purim, its counterpart, its second half, so to speak, is Purim. V'lachen bo harbe mishteh. That's why there's a lot of mishteh explaining why. There's no greater holiday for the Jew than Yom Kippur. Ve'erv Yom Kippurim. B'shvil simchash Yom Kippurim nitkan. We know that there's no greater holiday than Yom Kippur. I'll explain in two minutes. And therefore, we even have a day preceding Yom Kippur as a day of festivity, of eating and drinking, because of that simch Yom Kippur. And what, that's all for the simcha that there's a Yom Kippur. The fact that there's a day which we can actually return back to, you know, to a clean slate. That's unbelievable. The simcha of Kapara is so unique and so special. You know what it is to actually, like, erase the past and start again? There can't be anything. Anybody living life knows that is, like, beyond special. Giving us what you would call a second chance. <laughs> second 70th chance, whatever chance it is, you're however old you are. Okay? Then he says, Ubishru Simcha Shal Chuba. But there's another festivity on Yom Kippur that you actually did Chuba. You actually repented. You did something. Not only did God, you know, allow your second chance, you actually went through your own metamorphosis. You made commitments. You decided, at least you hope, you wish, you will. You want to do something. You want to make your life a better life. There's a reason of being happy, not just because of Yom Kippur, because of your tshuva. And you really can't do much at Yom Kippur. Because on Yom Kippur, you're fasting. V'chulon Kabbalah Satayra. And all this is the idea of Yom Kippur because it's all a day of once again Kabbalah Satira. We all know that the Luchos are Rishonos, were um, were, were given to Moshe actually in his hands on Shiva Asher Betamus, and he was supposed to come down on Shiva Asher Betamus, and that was supposed to be the day of Kabbalah Satira, where we actually received the Luchos. And if you look in the Chumash, Aaron says to the Jews once they had the golden calf, he says, Chag leyudke vavke machar. There will be a holiday not to this golden calf, but rather to the infinite God tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow Moses is coming down with the Luchos. So Yud Zayim Batamas is really supposed to be the great Yom Kabbalas Atayra. Shavuos is the Yom the Sina Satayra. Yes, God came and said, The process of giving himself to man started on Shavuot. 
When did we receive the testimony? When did man get this in his hand? The great holiday was supposed to be Shiva Asura Thomas. But what happened on that day, that holiday became a day of fasting because on that day, in front of our eyes, he broke the Lucho. So we did not get that which God gave on, uh, God, God stood on the mountain on, Shish, on sixth day of Sivan. No. When did we get it again, finally, on Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur is Yom Matan Luchas Shaniyash. The Mishnah says this in uh, in Tainish, the, the three, two greatest holidays for Jews during the Second Temple specifically were two, there were no happier days than Yom Kippur and two, 15th day of Av. 15th day of Av celebrates the fact that Jews could finally marry each other. There's no more Gezerah. I'm not going to the why that we once discussed this. I'm not going to do it now. And Yom Kippur, it was so special that we, we, we reconnected to God and reconnected, reaffirmed a covenant with God. We decided to be a day of, of making covenantal relationships of young people dating and marrying. And that's why Yom Kippur, as you all know, was a day where the boys would meet the girls in a very holy way, a very special way, and they would actually uh, match, 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 matches were made. It's shit. It's our St. Valentine's Day. What can I tell you? Okay. And this is Dafka done on Yom Kippur because this is the day of reaffirming the covenant between God and man. We thought that the covenant went to pieces with the eagle. The Ramban points out, no, it didn't. It just had to be reaffirmed again on Yom Kippur. That's why on Yom Kippur was a day of matchmaking. Because just as we decided, we, God said, listen, I'm with you and we're together. Well, that's the case. Make, make your own, make, this, make your own life together. So that's Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is Yom, and this is the, that was done under because we came back because of our tshuva, because they accepted our kapora. The end result of that whole thing is the reaffirmation of our covenantal relationship and the matan Torah that we finally received. When do we celebrate that? We kvetch and cry on Yom Kippur. When do we celebrate matan Torah of Yom Kippur? So the Gaur writes, Upurim kemashikasev hodu kiblu avimei the Gura simply writes that, you know what? Every holiday has an aspect which is totally for God, an aspect which man rejoices with that encounter with God. On Yom Kippur, it's one day of totally belonging to God. Purim is the day we rejoice with what we had on Yom Kippur. So Simcha's Purim is supposed to be a Simcha of Kabbalah Satyra, Actually, to the extent that I have Yom Kippur, that's the extent I have a Purim. And that's what he writes. If every Yom Kippur is chetzi lachem, the chetzi lachem, half to God and half to man, that's why we spend half the day, most of the day in shul, listening to Yitzchus and all the other stuff. And then finally we sit down to a Suda. Or you're supposed to learn half a day, daven half a day, and then the Suda and Samech half a day. As the Ramam writes it for Yom Kippur, well, Yom Kippur, it's a whole day versus a whole day. Purim is the other half of Yom Kippur. Of, 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 of Yom Kippur. This is what the Gura writes over here. It's based on a Tikkun Zoyer. I'm not going to I quote my Mokum for you, but Kabbalah Al-Azman. It's based on Tikkun Zoyer, which draws parallels between the Yom Taibim. It draws a parallel between Shmini Atzeres and Shvuas. It draws a parallel between Yom Kippur and Purim. That's a Tikkun Zoyer. Okay, so obviously that is the Simcha of Purim. I say this because I was asked yesterday, how are we going to rejoice on Purim this year when there's so much tragedy happening? And I says, I don't understand. The only, I don't know why you rejoice on Purim. I rejoice on Purim because God tells me that um, he's always with me. And we reconfirm our, 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 our covenantal relationship even when we're, we've turned our back on him. And that's why he gave the Lucho Shneis. And this is the party of, your, of, of, of Purim. Because on Purim, we decide to reaffirm that relationship again. Explain in a few minutes how. But that's what happened. 
the uh, Bahag writes the Bala Rachok Dolot of Yudoi Gaon. Also, the Shiltes of Rabbi Choy Gaon in Shilta Samach Zayin. They both write that Yafa Yom Purim to Yom Shenitna Bataira. Purim is literally a Yom Shenitna Bataira. We'll explain that in a minute how that works. But to understand, look at Purim and understand what you're rejoicing. You're not happy because things are good. You're happy because you are constantly connected to God and there's no, you know what? We can check out, but he never leaves. He's always there. We always have this relationship. We just have to shore up to it. On Purim, we rejoice on that relationship. So I say, you know, Ajra, but when things are terrible, when things are terrible, the only thing I can be happy with, what's left, at least I have God is with me. I don't always understand how. And sometimes I feel that he's not. But Purim tells me he always is. I always tell my students when I was a young boy growing up in Chicago. And, you know, the neighborhood was full of people that had left religion because of anger, because of the Holocaust. And I remember going back to Shul. Remember which Shul? Mishnah Gemara, I still remember. And we were walking back to Shul and I asked my father, Dad, how come we're religious? He looked at me and says, what do you want? He says, listen, X isn't religious, Y isn't religious. They all grew up also in these yeshivas, etc. They all dropped because God was never there, wasn't there before them. This one lost this, this one lost that. You know, the neighbor was full of people that lost most of their families. It was, you know, it was a post-Holocaust uh, area. It's like, uh, remember those years, the early 50s. So I'm... Um, um, my father stopped in the street and says, Mendel, you'll never understand, but believe me, he was always there with me. And I always say, I'm already an elder citizen. I'm still, you know, ooh. and uh, I, I still don't understand my father. It's okay, but I believe him. He felt that he was with him. And that's exactly what Purim is telling me. Sometimes, you know, so I think we must rejoice in that. In this time, especially, but it has to be rejoicing of, and that, not on the shtusim and the avolim, on the wasted time and on, on the imbecile behavior that people take a holy day, of of, of of celebrating the connection to God even when the chips are down, and, and, and taking it to be I don't know to act as buffoons. I hate to say it. Uh, I'm ashamed to be near the certain institutions on Purim, even institutions of higher Jewish learning. Uh, so when I used to have my own Purim, it was like Yom Kippur in the house, you understand? But uh, now I run away. I can't handle it. It really bothers me. It bothers me a lot taking a holy day like this and, uh, and flipping it into something which is empty-headed foolishness. Now, I once came to KBY, there were four guys dressed as the Pink Panther. He says, what does the Pink Panther have to do with work? You simply want to say that you're an idiot. Okay, so come wear it and shear tomorrow. You know what I mean? I know you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, the Pink Panther. What is it? That is not, it's a way of releasing and acting as a fool. They lose inhibitions and show their childish dreams as opposed to losing inhibitions and revealing, you know, uh, the deep religiosity which lies in them and their connection to God as well. That's what it's supposed to be. I want us to understand this in the most profoundest way. This has to be said. In light of this, I'm going to read, and I'm, in, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to do my best to this orally and review it. And, and this is what I'm going to tell you what we learned so far. So far, we learned. The Torah is called the Mashal HaKadmoni. It's the parable of the ancient one, which meant to say, as we discussed in previous classes, the wisdom of God stems not from God's experiences, but from God's essence, as opposed to our wisdom stems from our experiences, which have been internalized and created mental images, and that's what we're wise with. God of infinity... His wisdom is an expression of the infinite self. He is wise, but that one is only him. And he's not a, a multi-level persona. He's infinite. Therefore, by definition, his chachma is nothing more than an expression of the infinite self. Now, if that would be the case, and that is the case, what can we, how do we grasp his wisdom? 
And here there's a big difference. When I try to understand your wisdom, if I really want to understand you, I have to understand your background. I have to understand your culture. I have to understand your language. And then I can figure out what these words and these sounds mean to you. Then I'll know what you mean. Until I do that, I'll only know what those words meant to me. <laughs> but I don't know what you meant. I have to get under your skin. Anybody married here will understand that in a very simple way. God. It doesn't matter what she, what, what she said. It matters what she meant. And sometimes the sounds of silence are the hard, the loudest ones. God help me. Don't you understand by now? My mother-in-law once told me in the beginning, she says, Mendel says in Yiddish, she's very nice. I'm a shluft of ein kishen, kick when ein kop. You know, you sleep on one pillow, you finally get one head. Okay? But it takes time. <laughs> it says, the words are meaningless. What does the lady mean? Okay? That's the, the truth of the matter is that all people who listen to people, if they want to understand not what the man said, but what he meant with those words, they have to get into the person's personality, into his cultural background, into his usage of language. And finally, you understand the intent of the speaker. And that's a real Talmud. That's a real Talmud. A Talmud is one who understands not what the rabbi said, the teacher said, but rather what are the nuances of how he said it, because what did he mean? What were the pauses and the silences? What, did, what he said, he can be interpreted in a million ways. What did he mean? That's the key issue for how does he use language? One who learns Talmud in a correct way will develop a sense of understanding, for example, usage of language of the Rashi. You finally understand not what the man said, but what he meant, because as much as what he said, there's a floor full of books written. What could be shot in Rashi, but once you get to know him, you realize that X amount of percent of them are not worth reading. Because they're trying to inject themselves in the Rashi, not trying to understand Rashi from himself. Same thing applies with books that try to explain Maimonides. They try to stick their Polish ideas into Maimonides' world of thought. Why don't you try to explore his language, his world of thought, his way of thinking? I can tell you right now, he did not grow up in Brisk. You know what I mean? He had his way of thinking. Try to figure out what the man meant, for goodness sakes. That's what you're supposed to be doing if you're intellectually honest scholar. All the rest is cute, but it's not the truth, as one would say it in the bluntest way possible. Well, then, it's all true. It's all true for me and man, because I can understand the person. I can understand the person. But I, in order to grasp what he meant, I have to go all through the different usages of language. And he says A, but he means B. So every sentence he's saying could be a, 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 a medium to another idea, to another idea, and finally I'll get to what he meant. So actually every dialogue is a bunch of parables. It's a bunch of this will lead to that, A will lead to B, B will lead to C, and finally I'll get to what he really meant. When it comes to God's wisdom, it's endless. We'll never know what he really meant. Because we can't encompass God's culture, because we can't encompass the infinite nature of God. The best we can do is understand the best we can with the, the closest we are, the intellectually honest we are, and the culture we have to understand somehow of what those words should be meaning in the purest sense that a human can attain. But he will never know exactly what God meant because to understand that you'd have to encompass the infinite God. That's why any competent interpreter is saying the truth. For the truth of Torah lies not in what did God mean, but what can a human in pure intellectual honesty and total uh, being enculturated with the culture of Torah, its language, its nuance, etc., what can these words mean? And they can mean a lot of different things, and they're all truths, because there's no acid test, except for does this fit with the whole picture? That's what we call Elu Ve'elu Divrei Elohim Chayim. Because God talks to man, God wants man not to know what he meant, 
But what can man do his best to understand what the words mean? It can't be more than that if you want. Now, in order to understand something, let's get this very straight. I can have a great idea, but I've learned multiple times that things that I take for granted, suddenly there's so many other ideas there which I never even thought about, which I only discovered when I had to teach it to my 18 to 20 year old adolescents in KBY. And suddenly I feel I have to go under the table, talk, gobble like a turkey to explain things which are obvious. And by explaining, I suddenly uncover there's a whole plethora of ideas here, which I took almost subconsciously as a given. And all of a sudden they develop into unbelievable things. Because now I have talked the language of the children, of the students. They won't understand my language. My job as a teacher is to say it in the world where well, they will understand it. And it's just so many different ideas coming out of that. This is a Gemara. When the Gemara says that Rabbi Akiva was shown to Moshe Rabbeinu. And he heard Rabbi Akiva say a drasha. And he said, uh, and this is Moshe Misenai. And Moshe, God says, Moshe says to God, I, I, I heard that? I don't even know about it. Why are you saying to Moshe Messina? And what does it mean? It's very simple. It means to say, you know, Moses heard it in its purest form. In its purest form, there's, there's, there's mountains of wisdom there which are not expressed. They are nuanced. But when it had to be brought down to the language of people like Rabbi Akiva or his academy, it had to be explained at a much lower level. And thus, automatically, a lot of other things popped out, which had, which laid there dormantly, dormantly. But here, now, they're spread out and said. So, of course, everything that, 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 that Rabbi Kiva says ultimately lies in the core of wisdom that Moses received at Sinai. But the language of Rabbi Akiva, which therefore uncovered a lot of myriads of ideas, which were in that core of intelligence, come out because you're now talking at a lower level. This is what the Rebbe says, the Torah is a mashal of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. They're all external parallels, uh, parables, which take one, leads to another idea, leads to another idea, leads to another idea, until finally you get something which as much as you humanly can be closest to God himself. You know, a little child, when he reads Mishnayis, he reads stories. He doesn't even realize it's a law. He sees people picking up lost objects in the street. Who does it belong to? He learns that forever the law suddenly sees that the story is nothing more than a case. And he's been looking at a book of rulings. He learns further. He realizes those rulings are nothing more than expressions of a broad halachic idea and concept. He lives further, he realizes, that when he finishes Shas, he realizes this is a meta halakhic concept, which is expressed in a few ideas. He lives deeper and further, he realizes behind this, there's philosophical underpinnings, philosophy of the law, ultimately to the metaphysics, ultimately to who knows where. Every stage that you see, you get, is a mushal to a next stage, which is profounder and deeper. Every time when you think you retain, that's it. There's so much more. The more you know, you realize you know nothing because there's so much more to know. It's like walking a ladder. Okay. You got up to the first level. Okay. Now there's another one. <laughs> there's so much more to go. It's endless. Great thing you did, but there's so much more to go. So he said, that's why it's called Moshe Kadmoini. Because ultimately, what are we going to do in Gan Eden? What is the ultimate goal of creation? I do not know. What is the ultimate reward for those people who are created in this world? That is to be nenem izivashchina, to have the pleasure of comprehension of their relationship with God. That's understanding God and his relationship with man. Well, that knowledge, that endless, that infinite God, lies in the, the, the parables to that lie in your learning Talmud, Mishnah, Gemara, Chumash and the more parables you collect in this world the closer you will be the more tools you will have to understand whatever you will be able to understand in that end of history 
And if you didn't bother to collect all that information and that thinking process, you didn't collect all those mishalim, and you're left back in the old, I don't know, eighth grade in Ramaz when you should have been, I don't know where, you know, top guy in KBY or YU, wherever it only be, like knowing Nushin Ezekiel, like I know my name, you know what I mean? You know what you did? You were saying, God, I really don't care if I get close to you or not. I don't really care if I know you or not. Because learning Torah is getting developing the tools of life to be understanding and being close to God in the pure sense in the of the Shamas. And if you don't do it, it's a nice way of saying you're telling God, I really don't care about it. It's because of that the Gemara says, call me should be a little more the person who has the capability of learning and does not learn. I raise him is high benafsha, he's high chorus. The Rebbe explains because you're a nice way of telling God, I don't really care about you, and I don't really care about what you perceive as the ultimate sakhar for people, understanding your relationship with me and understanding Sadiqin Yashrim Benanim is Ziv Hashina. You don't care about that. You won't be nendem as if a if you don't have the mashalim, you don't have the tools, you don't have a language. You have as much as you'll have tools, you'll be able to grasp whatever you grasp. On the other end, he says, what about a person which doesn't have the time? Life didn't give him the time. His education didn't give him the capability. And all he can do is really is do kriyashma shachris and kriyashma arbis that's all the Torah can learn. You know, that's all he has. He can't do more. Man can't do more than what God is giving him in his life. That means to say that God says, that's your neshama is ultimately supposed to get to that level of mishalim, not more. So don't cry. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for God's purpose. And God's purpose brought your soul in the world in a certain situation to facilitate his purpose. And for that, you will get a certain relationship with God, which depends on the Mishalim that you accumulated. It may be the mush of Parsha Achtas Shachar with Parsha Achtas Harvest. That's okay. You didn't tell God, I don't care about you. you. said, God, I'd love to, but I simply, you know, you put me in a world which I do have to go to work. So that's the cloud. There's no steer between Komishi Yochalum and Ben Lamed is high forest. And the other person is that Vasapta Ganecha you go to work, you don't have time. It means that the God didn't expect you to have time. And therefore you're not being Mazalzul in Kabat Shamaim. Forget you're you're you 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 you're, you're accepting Kabat Shamaim. I want you to look at the page where it says uh Vizesha Amru Khazal in the second paragraph. I just want to read that word. He says um, if I can't, I, I, what do you want me to do? I, I, that's how I grew up. That's my situation. I go to work. I can't do more than the chmeis was uh, a half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. Can't do more. Okay. It means this is God telling you that that's, that, that, that's enough for you. Your soul doesn't need more at the moment. Your purpose was not for that. It's a very big insight here because we didn't come to this world to have sakhar. We came to this world to facilitate God's rutsin and will. And each, you know, every company needs a CEO. It needs a director. It needs a manager. It also needs a plumber. Get used to it. Okay, it also needs the guy that cleans in the after the office is closed. We need all that. And don't, you know, God decide that your job is this. And that's my job. I don't know. I don't think I'm better or worse than it. Does anybody think the carburetor is better than the motor or the motor is better than the spark plugs? No, we have one goal. The car's got to move. <laughs> okay. So that's what's important. So a spark plug and a little microchip is just as important as the V8. You know, oh, today everything's electric, but I don't even know what it's called anymore. You know, whatever it is, these different things, it doesn't matter. So this is the idea of Libra Tyra. Libra Tyra is the idea of receiving Tyra means we receive the capability 
of Ani Kirvashalakim Litoy, ultimately we should become one with God through our understanding. And that's number one. So here I'm going to say something. I'm going to, re- I'm going to say this again about that. Jews received this great Matan Torah. The Rebbe writes, well, first of all, they went to hell. They went to hell of Gullus and Mitzrayim. They went to hell. Why do we have to go to hell to get to this? What is like the reason that we had to go to hell in order to get Torah? So he points out something unbelievable. He says, you really want to get something, you have to be in a sense of, you know, I'm going to say the truth, even being a student, I was a student to my teacher for many years. Many years. Mom, I sat by his feet for 10 years straight. Okay? Mom is sat. And I'm going to tell you what I learned by being a student. A student has to be able to annul himself and mom is creativity and first learn how to accept. There's a time for talking, but there's also a time for absorbing. Yes, you you have discussions, you analyze, you said you're not an idiot. You're you're a challenging student. But you're there to first of all, I'm not here to uh uh this isn't a boxing match. You're the teacher, I'm the student, you're the giver, I'm the recipient. You're going to teach me how to think, and I'm going to fight with you. But we're not in the same league. A Talmud is butel to Israel. In a way, to be a Talmud, you have to be butel. You have to be somehow annul yourself in front of your teacher to really accept. That's the honest truth. If you're going to walk in with your ego, you'll be so defensive, you'll never have, you'll never want to hear. You'll never be open to thinking. You'll be, you'll be holding your, uh, you'll be holding your, your fort, man. You'll be defending your position. You won't be open to a serious, open intellectual conversation, like quest. You have to, have to let go of your ego. You have to, a certain extent, trust that this man cares about you and will nurture you, that you will finally be able to accept, express, express yourself independently. And that's what he wants. But you have to be able to let go. I've had too many people in my classroom, I hate to say it, they had to break their ego in order for them to finally become students. Here I'll tell you a story. There was a boy once, he was an older boy in Israeli, he was learning by... There was a Raman Yeshiva, Zechotzai, the Rocher of David Ka, a very big Talmud Chacham. And this guy terrorized your David. You know? So the Yeshiva of Gopal called me and says, listen, I need you to take this boy in your shear because you he's like a wild horse. You have to ride him bronco. You know what I mean? You have to uh, break him. So I looked at him and says, are you serious? You want me to do that? He says, Yes. Do you allow me free reign? He says, do whatever it takes. Just make sure he doesn't run away from the yeshiva and uh, break him. He says, okay. So don't, afterwards, when his daddy calls you up, don't complain to me. Okay. I'm in Shir. The kid's in the first. He's a very bright kid. Comes in the first day. I ask a question. I barely had a chance to finish the question. His hand, shut up. You know, I looked at this kid, says, uh, his name was Emmanuel, I can tell you that. He says, I don't know you, and you don't know me. But I'm going to tell you something. In this room, nobody talks before he thinks. Now, you, wrote, you push your hand up so fast, there ain't no way. I want to tell you right now, if you say something correct, I will raise you to the heavens. But if it isn't, I will bury you so deep, no one's going to uncover you. He looks at me, and his hand went down. He beca- we became the best of friends, and he was a Talmud. I had to break it. Brother dear, here we listen. Here we think. Here we don't jump. Now, I don't know if I would get a job at Harvard by doing that, and probably any other yeshiva I'd be fired, but this one was Rishus with the Goldfish, so I got away with it. 
but it, it's it, it's my legacy. I do it to my students. You can ask, and you all have children there that learned by me. They went through things like that. Okay, no grant. You must. This is not new to you, huh? Uh, this is the way it is. So a town that needs bittel. If there's bittel, he becomes a clay kibble. If he becomes a clay kibble, afterwards he's a mine and he's gobble. You have to be able to form somebody. You can't inform somebody unless he's under anesthesia. You're about to do brain surgery, for goodness sakes. You can't have him in a, in a defensive posture. He has to be open to change, open to thinking. You have to, like, I, this is open brain surgery. This is it. I do it every day, for goodness sakes. I know exactly what I'm doing. Okay, and this is the reality that we live with. So you have to be butt out. You know what? First of all, the Jews had to be slaves. They had to be totally egoless, with no bit, pure bittle. They were perfect raw material for forming, because that's what a slave is. He is formed by his master. So the Yisurim and the Gullus with the perfect reality of creating the raw material, which now they can be formed by God. And what that alone was not enough. They actually had said Nasa Vanishma, which is lauded tremendously by the Kodesh Baruch that they're willing to accept things without even knowing what they're going to accept. We're going to accept total bittle. How did that bittle happen? How could they attain such a high level of bittle when there were pagans not more than a year ago. We were pure pagans. Halala Ivda Vedazor, Halala Ivda Vedazor. 80% of them were not even redeemed from Egypt, for goodness sakes. Only 20% were, and they were all pagans. Bigamora said that even when they crossed the Yamsuf, they had a Vedazor in their pockets. Yecheskel described this in the 20th chapter of Yecheskel. How all through the midbar they were itching to be over of a deserve. How did they attain this level of, of, of bittle? And the answer is because the Gemara says, Kofa Aleim Har Kigigis. Now, this approach is the approach of the Ramban that Kofa Aleim Har Kigigis happened before they said Nasa Vanishma. Because Nasa Vanishma happened on the day after Matan Taira when they when they made the covenant, and Kafalem Hakigigis happened on the day of Matan Taira. God arrived on Vav Sivan, but the covenant, the final acceptance of the covenant, the Nasa Vanishma was on Zion Sivan. Please remember that. That's the Ramban based on Mechilta, argues with Rashi. It says what create what is what does it mean? You don't really think that God picked up the mountain and said, hey, boy, guys, this is a shotgun marriage. You guys accept this. If not, I'm throwing it on you. You really think God picked it up and threw it on Let, Let's understand what this means. So if you look at the Targum Yonason of Yonason ben Uziel in Exodus 19, verse 17, he writes as follows. I think I have it here somewhere. Let's see if I have it. Let's see if I have it. Yeah. The verse is as follows. I'll say it in Hebrew. And Moses took out the people to meet the Shekhin of the presence of God. Mina Machli, he took them from the Machli. Umiyad, and immediately Talash Adon HaOlam Sahar. So to speak, the master of the world uprooted the mountain. It left it standing in air. It reminds you of a very famous painting of a rock. Okay, you all probably know what I mean. The hanging rock. Okay. And it was translucent and clear as a mirror. And they stood under that mountain. What does it mean? that the, the mountain was translucent, it was clear. It's very obvious that anybody who's used to Russian of Chazal, we want to describe clear vision of prophecy, we call it Aspakleria Meira. 
a clear mirror, a clear, that's what it is, a clear glass, that's what it means. Aspaklerya she'ina mira means not a glass, but a mirror, a mirror which has something behind it, and therefore you see yourself, you don't see what's behind the mirror. Aspaklerya mira means you can see through the glass, straight ahead. The between glass and a coated glass, which is a mirror. Aspaklerya mira means a glass which you can see through and it's the light that penetrates it. Aspaklerya she'ina mira means to say it is a glass which is coated in the back and therefore you can't, the light doesn't go through it. When it says here that the hanging mountain was an aspaklerya mi'ira, it was clear, it shone, it was bright. What does it say? It meant to say that basically this is a prophetic vision that they realized that this is the only way we can justify our existence. And without that, our, in living shallowly, without Torah, equals death. They suddenly had a mind-expanding uh, experience in which they realized that without accepting Tyra, life is meaningless. And that's why they said Nasev and Nishma. They suddenly realized that nothing means anything except for that. So obviously they negated everything else, but there was nothing worth negating. They suddenly saw a pure truth. Can you imagine how they were angry afterwards when they woke up in the jingle jangle morning that comes after? When in reality, they didn't, this was artificial. God induced them with a mind expanding experience. He was Timothy Leary before his time, man. He blew their brains with an idea which is way beyond their station. And because of that, they accepted this Torah. And then they wake up the next morning, what did we do? This is seduction of a minor. You, we've manipulated our brain. And that was the Nasim and Nishma, and that's what the Gemara says, that Rabbah says in Shabbos Peches, woo, there's something deficient in our acceptance of the Torah because it was done under seduction of a, an enormous revelation which didn't give us the capability of judging can we or do we want to have this at our natural state. You raised us to a level of angels, and then obviously life meant nothing without Torah. So we said yes. Then we, but we didn't stay there. We came down, and then we started bickering all over again. And we bickered and we bickered and we bickered and we've been bickering through history. This is the Kafa Leim Haki Gigas. It's not that it's, it's, it's coercive with Das. Yes, God expanded our minds way beyond our normal state. It was Mi'al Hadas we received the Torah. And it says, actually, the Gemara says, my dear Rabbi Lai Raisa. And the Rabbi explains in Shabbos Peches. They say, yeah, that's when the Jews, when the 70 years, they thought they were over and God left them. They figured, Gamarno, the story is over. We don't want this. Goodbye. And they went to the festivities of Achashverosh, which was a party celebrating the fact that God had, not, had given up on the Jews. And the 70 years are over. There will not be a Migdash. It's all over. The covenant between God and the Hebrews is finished. And that was the party of Achashverosh. That's why it said he took out the Caleb of the base of Migdash, because basically there will not be a base of Migdash anymore. There will not be a Shivat Zion. God will not return to Zion. He left the Jews. The Lushan of the Gemara and Sanhedrin is that the Jews told Yechezkel, a master who freed his slave, why does he complain now that he doesn't act to him as a master? A lady which was divorced by her husband, why does the husband think that he now has a claim on it? They thought they were free, they thought they were divorced. They thought the game's over, goodbye. And they were happy, they went to their divorce party which was Yechashverosh's party. They celebrated their divorce from God. That's what they did. And because of that, God was angry and he wanted to destroy them. 
And they had to find, and you know what? Here's the craziest thing. The Gura writes and the Balatanya, they both write, that when Haman wanted to destroy Yehudim, the Gemara says, and we go, Yehudim means kofer ba'avoy de Zorah. If they would not be kofer ba'avoy de Zorah, Haman would have kept them. The Xerah was only on Jews which were willing to say, we do not walk away from God. And here's the crazy thing. They alone celebrated the divorce. Yet when push came to shove, well, you know, deny his existence, they said no. And for a year, they were grappling and they did what they did. It says, no, it doesn't make sense. God's not with us, but we're not letting him go. Reminds me of my dad, he said. You won't understand, but he's with me. And they found God, even when things were down. The Gemara says that before Purim, the prophet stopped saying, Akel ha-gadol ha-gibor va-nora. He says, what's his gadol? He's so great. His temple is destroyed and Goyim are having parties in the Khurban. He's a gibor. His poor children are in Golis. He isn't taking care of them. And they stopped saying it. After Purim, when they realized that God actually never leaves them, and there was no divorce, and you weren't freed, just he works behind the scenes. They suddenly realized, you know something? This covenant was actually never broken. And he actually never leaves us. They said, if that's the case, we want, to reaff- we want to reaffirm the covenant from ourselves. Once we discovered the God of Gullus, we want to do another Nasa Vanishma, not because we we're blown our minds, because we want to do it on our own. We attained a sense of self-annihilation when we realized in the worst situations we are, we went to a divorce party and God still is with us behind the scenes. And then they reaffirmed their covenant and then again said, but when did it happen? Well, look at Nehemiah chapter 9. In Nehemiah chapter 9, you have again a reaffirmation of the covenant after the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, which the Ramban says, why did they do it? Because of what they experienced on Purim. Kimu v'kibla Yehudim. When did they finally do that? Back when they came to Eretz Yisrael in the Chemianai. What was the cause of it? Because of what they met when they met the God on Purim. They met the God behind the scenes, which one doesn't know he's there, yet somehow he calls the shots and plays the game behind us. Rabbi Yaakov Enden says in his Akdama to his Siddur, If you want to understand the greatness of God, don't look at Kriya Shamsuf. Don't look at the Ten Plagues. Look at Jewish survival in history. He's a real Mark Twain approach. He says that is a bigger miracle than Kriya Shamsuf. That is Akela Gadol Agibor Vanerva. God of Jewish survival. The God behind the scenes of we of we're the Jewish survival. That is a bigger nest, he said, than all of you see us in Mitzrayim. should read it. I don't have it here in front of me, but I know I've I, I read it multiple times. This is what they met on Purim. And because of that, once again, they were revatal themselves. They gave up. Uh, we're not going to be opinionated. Whatever you say goes, because we realize you're always with us. Realize you're with us even when we're not aware of it. And therefore, we're going to accept you without asking questions. So the Simcha of Purim is the Simcha of Kabbalah Satira and of self-annihilation of Das. Accepting it the way it is, not because it fits us. Because how can we not? Because he's here, even when it doesn't seem that it fits him, because how can he not? It's a reciprocal relationship of we're tied to the hip and therefore how can we not be together? 
It's a story of Romeo and Juliet. It's a story of, we're one. Ata echad, b'shimcha echad, mi ka'amchi Yisrael goy echad b'horetz. That's what this is about. That's what Purim is all about. So the Rebbe writes, therefore, we have to reenact the fact that we are willing to be Jewish without das, bittel of our das. The idea of Purim is, can you really express your true connection to Torah and mitzvot even without your das, beyond your das? Because it's in you, it's part of you. How can you not? So actually, Purim is a terrible final. You see, Avoid Hashem starts on Pesach and ends in order. It's a year. That's the Jewish calendar. The first young the first encounter with God is Pesach. Shruz, finally, Sukkot, blah, blah, until finally Purim. Rebbe Leibel writes, Purim is the end of the year. And it's the Achana to the beginning of the new year called Pesach. It's what you call Chazora week. <laughs> it's what you call final. You know what the final is? How much Judaism, how much Nasa and Nishma is in, your, in you without Das? Purely from a sense of Bittel. Purely a Nasa and Nishma, because how could I not? How much of your Judaism is internalized? Which is not tempered by your intellect, by your by your thought, by your social norms, purely because that's who you are. And that's the acid test. I end this with a story that I heard from my Rebbe Zechariah and the Brucher of Putner. He said, "You know, guys, go to yeshiva, but let me tell you what the real acid test is. Guys in the yeshiva like two pots on the stove, and they're all bubbling." But how do you know which pot is half full and which pot is, is, is full? When you take the fire off and they get off the fire, you see what's left in the pot. In yeshiva, they all look like they're bubbling. How much is left in the pot after they leave? How much is internalized? How much is, is internalized the way they think, the way they talk, the way they act? That's the acid test. The shaloi midas. The Midas is easy. They all act the same. They all look like a bunch of penguins. The question is, what's Shalai Midas? What do they do when they're in the workforce? What do they do when they're wearing their polo shirts and playing hockey? I don't know what. How do they act? What do they do? What are their value systems? That's what counts. That's the Ben Taira. That's, uh, that's the test of Purim. I remember he once told me personally, we were discussing this idea, he says, Mendel, you should know, you need a thousand tons of das to give away a little bit on Purim. If you don't have that much, don't squander it. <laughs> Be careful. It's a very dangerous test. I say this when I think of little boys frolicking, acting as fools on Purim. They don't understand. This is a terrible, a very profound day, and it's a terrible, it's a, it's, it's a heavy test. What do you sound like when you lose certain inhibitions? What comes out? What's for real? And what? You end up sounding like Daisy the cow. Maybe it would have been better if you had kept your inhibitions. Have a meaningful Yoimat and Torah, don't squander it, have a great Yom Tif. and we should be Zoichet and Nasev and Nishma, have a good Yom Tif, people. Bye. Take care. Uh, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Kol Tif. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. My pleasure. Bye, Ben. Rebbe's around later this week to talk? I'm around. It's a fine game. I'm around. <laughs> send, okay. send, send me, a, send me a, a WhatsApp and we'll talk. Okay. Very good. Call to. Bye. Call to. Bye-bye.